last word. All right, on with the sports news of the day for Sports and Songs. Kind of an abbreviated edition here. Um, just got some NASCAR and some wrestling we're going to cover here today, at my end anyway. Now, first of all, NASCAR was announced this week. Clint Boyer, no relation, uh, announced he's going to retire from NASCAR at the end of the racing season. It'd been kicked around because he kind of followed the COVID racing when it started, when they did on the video game. He was kind of doing some announcing with Jeff Gordon on Fox, but not really. He was kind of commentating as he was driving. It was always kind of said, hey, when Clint retires, he'd be a great announcer. He's got that charisma. He's got charisma. He's got personality. Everybody, you know, the other drivers like him, so they'll talk to him. So we'll see how that goes. Some were saying after his bad finish at the last race, maybe escalated this. He's 11th place out of the 12 guys right now. Top eight, move on. He basically needs to win this week to, to go on. Some are saying that's why he's retiring. Not the sore loser part, but the, okay, I'm out of it. I can relax now. And you don't want to be trying to win and ever talk about retirement. Oh, if you win, you're coming back. He's all but mathematically eliminated, so I think that's why he, personally, why I think he did it. He's calling it a, season after, or calling it a career after 16 seasons. Um, he announced he's going to be working with Fox. Like I said, so that'd be pretty interesting. Um, Clint Boyer's won racing on all three current NASCAR manufacturers, with Ford, Chevy, and Toyota, during his career, with uh, RCR, with Michael Waltrip Racing, and now with Stuart Haas. He's won with all of them. He took over Tony, Tony Stewart's number 14 car a couple years ago. I think it was 2016. Um, he's got 10 career cup wins. His best season was in 2012 when he finished second in the standings. He's also made the playoffs the last three years. Um, Clint, to me, yeah, because of the name, I started following him when he was in the under circuits coming up. You know, hey, same name, I got to follow him. And so I kind of always followed his career. I've always thought he was a different type of guy. I kind of liked that about him, you know. Um, not if race is hard. Some say he causes some crashes. He's a little too reckless. I kind of like that thrown away. Not, not, I don't like the fact he causes crashes, no. But I like the fact he's, you, know, you got to do what you got to do to win and try. And, you know, he never intentionally crashes anybody. It's just aggressiveness gets in the way sometimes. But Clinton 2021 will be starting the uh, announcing at Fox, which will probably be Daytona, so it will be very exciting to start there. Uh, going into the races this week in Charlotte, Clint is in 11th, 38 points out of first. Or out of eighth, I'm sorry. Um... Kyle Busch is ninth. He's 21 points out. So is Austin Dillon. 21 points is a lot to make up because of the big crash last week. That was hence the big spread on everyone. So if Joy, Joy Logano or Obama go down early, that could mean good for Kyle Busch or Austin Dillon or if they win. I mean, if Busch, Dillon, Boyer, or Amarillo win, they're in. You win and you're in. So that's always a possibility there too, but that's what they're saying. Um, the race is at 1.30 o'clock, 1.30 Central Time. We'll be on NBC. Um, also, just it's a road race at Charlotte. It should be very fun and exciting to watch. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Clint does good in road races. Uh, Chase Elliott's done good at the track there, so we'll see how that goes. I'm going to AEW Wrestling. They have their anniversary edition coming up this October 14th, Wednesday, their one-year anniversary. And I was looking at their website for AEW for... Show anything about future sites, because, you know, it's kind of trolling the other day on their Twitter account, see who they all follow. Hey, what are the wrestlers that they follow? I want to get the inside scoop or see who they're buddies with. And they follow all these different arenas, and one of the arenas they follow is Target Center here in Minneapolis. And that made me go, hmm, well, let's look. So that's the tight sites coming up. They are kind of starting to advertise dates, sitting out there, Assume hopefully the coronavirus pandemic ends. They're looking at a December 2nd show in New Orleans, Louisiana, at the Lakefront Arena, and in Albuquerque, New Mexico on December 30th. Now I looked ahead, and as far as I went ahead was July 14th of 2021, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at the UMW Panther Arena. Milwaukee's closed. Will they come here the week after? Are they going to do other house shows around then? Who knows? That's July of next year. With this pandemic, folks, we don't know what's going on next week, okay? But just a little excitement to kind of mark the calendar, look forward to it. Hey, maybe. 
just maybe we can get back to some kind of normalcy in our lives. So we'll look and see how that goes there. That's all I briefly got on sports right now. I'll have an update middle of the week next week on the playoffs for baseball, how they're all sizing up. A couple weeks from now, we got our one-year anniversary show. Big plans for that. But uh, middle of the week, because of scheduling conflicts for myself, I'm like, damn, it's kind of a patch the other show this week and next. I'll see how it goes. I might not be on next week, but I will have the birthdays in history. I know you guys love that stuff. I'll have a couple other bits like this, too. Um, I appreciate everybody that, that follows the show. Social media, here on Anchor, on YouTube. You, uh, you follow the Instagram videos and the blogs and stuff like that. Really trying to stretch out. We'd love to know what you appreciate the most. What do you want to hear more of? Hey, when you guys do a blog, we'd rather see this. Or we want to see an Instagram special on this. Or more of this, less of that. Um, anything you want to get in. Uh, is there a sport that we don't cover much you want us to cover more of? Um, you, don't ask us to cover less because we, we, we cover what we love, and that's the joys of it. But, okay, like with NASCAR, is there a certain guy you like? Um, in baseball or hockey is there, or college, is there a certain team you like you want us to cover more? Uh, we stay local here with Minnesota stuff, so with high school sports. What's your high school? What's your alma mater? What's your hometown? We'll kind of follow them some more, too. So let us know on social media sites. Catch us on the Sports and Songs Facebook page. Drop us a message on Twitter. Coming up this week, high school football started this weekend. Once polls come out in the middle of the week, we'll put those up on the Facebook page. Put the polls up for all the other fall sports coming up. I know they're wrapping up with their seasons. Very exciting time of year for high school sports. And it's glad to see them back. Hopefully no one gets hurt. Hopefully they're all having fun because that's what it's all about. That's why we're here to sharing the fun. And like I said, please let us know. We appreciate all of you. Thanks. Here at Sports and Songs, we use Anchor.fm as our platform for our podcast. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. Number one, it's free. Number two, there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your own phone or computer. Number three, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Number four, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. And number five, and finally, it's everything you need to make a great podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's A-N-C-H-O-R.fm. Okay, we're going to start off with the sports section of this week in history and birthdays. Start October 5th, 1908. Chicago White Sox pitcher Eddie Walsh beats the Detroit Tigers 6-1, to his 40th victory in the Major League Baseball season. Uh, forces AO pennant race to the final day. So 40 wins that season, you just don't see that anymore. 1938, with new ownership, the Detroit Falcons, Officially changed our name to the Detroit Red Wings. And the winged wheels introduced. Pre- previously named Cougars from the 26 to 30 season and Falcons from 30 to 32. 1970, Major League Baseball Championship Series both end on the same day with the same score. The American League, the Baltimore Orioles beat the Twins 3 0. National League, Cincinnati Reds beat the Pirates 3 0. The Orioles went on to win the World Series 4. 1976, Major League Baseball expansion draft. Seattle Mariners and Toronto Blue Jays picked 30 unprotected AL players. Rupert Jones, outfielder, was the first one pitched by Seattle. And Bob Baylor, outfielder for Toronto. 1996, Cleveland Indians strike out 23 Baltimore Orioles in 12 innings. And a 4-3 ALDS win at Jacobs Field. Orioles went on to win that series, though, 3-1. 2001. Barry Bonds hits his 71st and 72nd home runs in an 11-10 loss versus the Dodgers at Pacific Bell Park. But he did break Mark McGuire's Major League single season home run record. 2001, Major League Baseball's Atlanta Braves become the first pro sports team to win 10 straight division titles after mauling the Marlins 20-3 to clinch the National League East title. The Boston Celtics and 
basketball, one from 57 to 65, and the Lakers from 82 to 90. With, and that's only nine straight, so the Braves did it with 10 straight, which is incredible. Birthdays, 1902, Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's, and at one time owner of the Padres, was born at this day in Oak Park, Illinois. 1937, Barry Switzer, a football coach for Oklahoma and also coached the Cowboys for a few years, born in 1937. 1949, Bob James, born William or George William James, American baseball writer and statistician. He came up with cybermetrics, was born in Kansas. Uh, guys like me were kind of like stat geeks. Bill James was kind of a big inspirational. I remember back in the day, it was James was the guy that really went to for stats. Uh, 1965, Mario Lemieux, Super Mario, uh, Canadian-born hockey player, um, now team owner for the Penguins, but played there. He was a three-time MVP. He was born in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Also that same day, 1965, Patrick Roy, uh, goalie for the NHL for the uh, Montreal Canadiens. Uh, I believe he uh, managed the Colorado Avalanche for a few years, too, born in this day. 1972, one of the few Duke players I could stomach, Grant Hill, was born. Um, he played for the Detroit Pistons. I had a long career. Uh, started out injured, had a long career. Uh, started with the Pistons, also got an Olympic gold medal in 96. Uh, Grant was born in Dallas, Texas. October 6, 1945. <clears throat> Tavern owner Billy Goat buys seats for his goat at Game 4 of the World Series is escorted out and casts Goat's Curse on the Chicago Cubs. 1966, Jim Palmer, at age 20 of the Buffalo Orioles, is the youngest to pitch a World Series shutout. 1983, the New York Jets announced they'll be leaving Shea Stadium to play in the Meadowlands. 1985, New York Yankees' Phil Negro becomes the 18th pitcher to win 300 games, and also at age 46, comes the oldest to pitch a shutout by beating Toronto 8-0. 1991, New York Met pitcher David Cohn ties the National League record by striking out 19 Phillies. That record has since been broken since then, I believe. 1995, Colorado Avalanche, formerly the Quebec Nordiques, play their first game and beat Detroit. Birthdays, 1905. Helen Willis Moody, American tennis player who won 19 Grand Slams, was born in Centerville, California. 1927, Alice Bauer, American golfer, co-founder of the LPGA, was born in Eureka, South Dakota. 1955, Tony Dungy, former Minnesota Gopher football player, uh, coached for the Buccaneers and uh, Colts, uh, Super Bowl champion with the Colts as a coach. Uh, you can see him on NBC. I think it still does NBC uh, Sunday Night Football. Birthday 1955 for a coach to injury. 1959, Dennis Oil Cam Boyd. Uh, Oil Cam Boyd pitched for the Red Sox. His birthday. October 7th, 1984. <clears throat> Striking umpires return for game five of the NLCS for the Padres win the pennant. 1984, Walter Payton passes Jim Brown as NFL's career rushing leader. 1989, Ricky Henderson steals a record eight bases in a playoff series, five games. This is eight bases of five games. Birthday is 1973. Priest Holmes, running back of the Baltimore Ravens, was born in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. I think Priest Holmes played for the Chiefs also for a while. 1976. Charles Woodson, College Football Hall of Fame cornerback, Heisman Trophy in 97 at Michigan. Nine-time Pro Bowler, Super Bowl champion in 2010 with the Packers. Was born on that. October 8, 1956, Yankees pitcher Don Larson throws a perfect game as New York beats the Dodgers 2-0 in Game 5 of the World Series at Yankee Stadium. Uh, the next year, 1957, the Dodgers announced they will be moving to Los Angeles. 1973, National League Championship Series Game 3 brawl between Cincinnati Reds Pete Rose and New York Mets Bud Harrelson. Two very competitive players, two very hot-headed players. <clears throat> I was three at the time, so I don't remember the game. But I could see that probably brewing and happening. You see that lineups, that something was going to happen with those two players. 
Birthday is 1955. Bill Elliott, father to Chase Elliott. <clears throat> NASCAR winner, 1988, won the Winston Cup. Born in Dawsonville, Georgia, obviously. Uh, he had the name Awesome Bill from Dawsonville. October 9th, 1915, Woodrow Wilson becomes the first U.S. president to attend a World Series game. 1997, North Carolina's record-winning college basketball coach Dean Smith retires. Earth Days for October 9th, 1903, Walter O'Malley, American baseball team owner of the Dodgers, born in the Bronx, New York. 1959, Mike Singletary, the Bears. Look at Mike Singletary, look at his eyes. Yeah, great, he's got two of them, good deal. Middle linebacker for the Bears, born in 1959. October 10, 1904, Boston pitchers achieve 148 complete games in AL record. Also a record for total complete games in the American League, 1,098, and the National League, 1,089. 148 games, complete games. I don't even think the American League has that in a year anymore, or the National League has that in a year. Let alone major baseball combined in a year. Here, one team did it. Birthdays for October 10th, 1969. Brett Favre, quarterback Super Bowl champion for the Packers in 1931, born in Gulfport, Mississippi. Yes, Brett Favre played here in Minnesota for a while. Choked, couldn't handle it in the game against the Saints. Brett Favre, each team he played for. Packers, the Jets, and the Vikings. His last pass for all three teams was an interception. 1974, Dale Earnhardt Jr., uh, a racer, son of Dale Earnhardt. See how that works out there. Uh, won the Daytona 500 in 2004, uh, and in 2014, uh, the Bush Series Championship in 98-99, was born on this date in North Carolina. October 11th, 1927, New York Yankees First baseman Lou Gehrig is named the American League MVP. Despite hitting Major League record 60 home runs that year, his teammate Babe Ruth did not win it because at the time, the former winner was not eligible to win it again. 1968, Major League Baseball star Billy Martin named manager of the Minnesota Twins. 1992, prime time, Deion Sanders. He plays for both the Falcons in the NFL and the Atlanta Braves baseball in the same day. Birthday is 1961, Steve Young, Super Bowl uh, 88, 89, and 94, uh, MVP, Pro Bowl 92 through 98, uh, NFL passing TD leader 92 through 94, and 98, uh, played for San Francisco 49ers, born in Salt Lake City, Utah. And also birthday 1972, Cherokee Parks, uh, basketball played for the Dallas Mavericks, and the September Wolves were born on that day. Music history and birthdays. In 1978, Dolly Parton becomes the first country singer to pose for Playboy. 1979, ABBA visits the White House while on tour for the first and only time in America. They meet President Carter's, Carter's daughter, Amy, who was a big fan. 1959, Bobby Darren's swinging version of Mac the Knife, a song about a killer from Three Penny Opera hits number one on the Hot 100 and stays there for an astonishing nine weeks. Darren, who's known for a lighter fare like Splish Splash, gains a more adult following, putting him on par with Frank Sinatra. No, Bobby, you were not on par with Frank Sinatra. No one was on par with Frank Sinatra. Just don't let it. No. No one was on par with Frank Sinatra. 1994. Jamie Walters, who sang the number one hit theme song, How Do You Talk to an Angel, in the short-lived Aaron Spelling series, The Heights, joined Beverly Hills 90210 as Ray Proof, an aspiring musician. Unfortunately for Walters, his character takes a dark turn and starts abusing fan favorite Donna Martin, causing his real-life music career to suffer. So sad that people take your TV character and your real-life music and get him confused. 1991, Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion 2 debuts at number one, followed by Use Your Illusion 1 on Billboard's album charts. Birthdays, 1961, David Bronson, guitarist for the Counting Crows, was born in California. In 1947, Brian Johnson, lead singer of ACDC, is born in Gateshead, England. In 1943, Steve Miller was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but was raised in Texas. 
October 6, 2016, Prince's Paisley Park compound is open to the public. 1966, Tommy Stinson, guitarist, bass guitarist for The Replacements, was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And in 1951, Kevin Kurman, lead singer of Ario Speedwagon, was born in Evanston, Illinois. October 7, 1999, Garth Brooks releases an album as Chris Gaines, a character he created while he was intended, that was intended to be a movie. But the Rouse turns off many fans, and the album is Brooks' first since his 1995 that fails to debut at number one, charting behind Creed's Human Clay. And that's the thing. A lot of country music fans, in my opinion, are this way. If you don't sing country music, they've never heard of you. There is no other music besides country music. So he did Chris Gaines, a little more of a rock type sound, and they just didn't like it. They didn't care if it was Garth Brooks, it wasn't country music. They didn't like it, and that's what kind of bothered me. I thought the Chris Gaines album was okay. I, nothing special, I, it's okay. I, I just like to see other artists chart out like that, branch out. So it was kind of good for Garth to have the stones to do it. 1968. Long before the U.S. National Anthem became a performance piece, a Puerto Rican singer, Jose Feliciano, makes waves when he does a slow, jazzy version of the song before Game 5 of the World Series between the Tigers and Cardinals. Among those, in a, among those joining the uproar are Tigers starting pitcher Mickey Lolich, who complains that the overly long rendition screwed up his pregame routine. So the CS National Anthem was even an issue back in 68. It wasn't even a big deal yet. It's already an issue. But we don't talk politics on this show. 2008, Spotify launches the most launches the most streamed songs for October is Viva La Vada by Coldplay. For all of 2008, it's Human by The Killers. Ten years later, the company boosts boasts 180 million active users and over 40 million songs and podcasts including ours. Birthdays, 1953, Tico Torres, drummer for Bon Jovi, is born. Hector Juan Samuel Torres in New York. Yeah, I butchered that. It's whatever. It's my show. I can do that. 1951, John Mellencamp was born in Seymour, Indiana. He has a spina bifida but survives thanks to ex ex experimental surgery performed at Riley Children's Hospital in Indiana. Now, so he was born with spina bifida. The man smokes packs of cigarettes a day, and he still sounds great. Um, I've always loved John Guru Melkap, whatever you want to call him, his music. You don't see a lot of music like that anymore today, though. I really miss I wish we kind of had rock and roll like Johnny Mellon camp again. 1949, David Hope, bass guitarist of Kansas, is born in Topeka, Kansas. <clears throat> 1989, October 8, 1989. After the Rolling Stones, Ron Wood suggests that the Who were reforming for a money alone. The Who guitarist Pete Townsend publicly answers, Nick needed a lot more than I do. His last album was a flop. Referring to the Rolling Stones, ill received Dirty Work album. And in 1957, Jerry Lee Lewis recorded Great Balls of Fire. 1965, C.J. Ramon, bassist and occasional vocalist for the Ramones, was born Christopher Joseph Ward in Queens, New York. 1948, John Cummings is born in Long Island, New York. A founding member of the Ramones, he becomes Johnny Ramone. October 9, 1965. The Ohio State University marching band plays Hang On Sloopy for the first time when their football team takes on Illinois. Soup soon becomes an Ohio State University favorite. In 1985, is designated the state song of Ohio. Birthday is 1940. John Winston Lennon is born in Liverpool. The Winston comes from British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. John would later add Ono to his middle name in honor of Yoko. See, not only did Yoko ruin the Beatles, she ruined John Lennon's name. She's just bad news. 1948, Jackson Brown is born in Clyde Jackson Brown, Germany, where his American service his American serviceman father is stationed. October 10th, 2001. 
embracing the internet at the time when broadband was rare, U2 webcast a concert from the Elevation Tour in South Bend, Indiana, for free at YouTube.com, or at U2.com. 1992, country music was all the rage in America, as The Chase by Garth Brooks Day's views at number one on the album charts, supplanting Some Gave All by Billy Ray Cyrus, which held the top spot for 17 years before that. Early 90s, country music was very popular, um, as it charts were kind of becoming one. That's when you saw a lot of country music really blow up. Birthdays, 1961. Martin Kemp, bassist for Spandau Ballet, was born in London, England. Also known for his role as Steve Owen on the BBC soap opera EastEnders. 1958, country singer, singer Tanya Tucker is born in Texas. 1954, longtime Van Halen frontman David Lee Roth was born in Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana. October 11th, 2016, Rod Stewart is knighted at Buckingham Palace, becoming Sir Roderick David Stewart. 1981, opening a show for the Rolling Stones at Memorial Coliseum in Los Angeles, Prince gets booed off stage. The Stones have never had good intentions of bringing in a rising star, but his act wasn't a good fit for this crowd. And when he opens his trench coat and reveals a bikini brief, it gets ugly. Prince never again performed as an opening act. 1973, the divorce between Elvis and Priscilla Presley is finalized. The two remain close friends and walk out of the Santa Monica car courtroom arm in arm. Birthdays, 1962, Scott Johnson, rhythm guitarist and backing vocals for the Gin Blossoms is born. In 1946, Daryl Hall of Hall & Oates is born Daryl Franklin Hall, H-O-H-L, in Portstown, Pottstown, Pennsylvania. 1932, country singer-songwriter Dottie West is born Dorothy Marie Marsh near McMinnville, Tennessee. And that is it for this week in sports and music, history, and birthday. Hey guys, Andy here with Sports and Songs. Doing our uh, special tribute this week, uh, as we do to one. Rock legends pass away. Earlier this week, Eddie Van Halen passed away on October 6th. <clears throat> now, early in the week, so I'm sure you've all heard tons and tons of uh, other guys mention their, oh, I remember the time I recorded Eddie with this, or stories that had with Eddie Van Halen. All great, great stories. Um, so I'm not going to bore you with a lot of the blah, blah, blah about Eddie. You've all heard it this week. One of the great things I love about Eddie Van Halen is, you know, Eddie wasn't big in the social media spotlight. He kept to himself, and that's what I really respect about Eddie. Everybody loved him. He was just, you know, one of, arguably one of the Mount Rushmore guys of guitar players. Eddie Van Halen would be on there. If not the Eddie Van Halen Memorial, Mount Rushmore, and then four other guys. That could be an argument made, too, for Eddie. Very genius is not a good enough word to describe the way he was musically. He'd helped write all the songs Van Halen had done. Um, like I said, the great thing about Eddie is you, you don't know what Eddie ever thought of other things publicly. He just kept to himself and kept to the music, which is, I think, what I respect about Eddie Van Halen the most. You don't know if Eddie liked Coke or Pepsi. You don't know if he liked Ford or Chevy, if he was this or that, or A or B or black and white. Eddie was Eddie, and everybody respected that. No one hounded him for his opinions. He didn't see him on social media complaining about this, that, or anything, or patting someone else on the back. It was just Eddie and his guitar. And um, Alex was the same way. I mean, the only quote I'm going to share with you was uh, what Alex Van Halen left. And Alex, again, like Eddie, no social media. Uh, the quote I have here, it says, Van Halen drummer and Eddie's brother Alex, who does not have a regular social media presence was the last way in, meaning he was the last kind of, of all the celebrities and band members and other musicians to say something. Weighed in on the Van Halen news desk, social media site. Simply put, hey Ed, love you. See you on the other side. Your brother Al. 
And that's the way those two guys were. Or the way Al is and the way Eddie was. Just, this is the way we are. Boom. Um, Eddie Van Halen will be missed. He's an inspiration to tons of guitarists out there. And he always will be. For years to come. I always look back, even guitarists who are just starting, I guarantee will still say Eddie Van Halen was an influence. Eddie's influenced a lot of guys today. Subconsciously even. They probably don't even realize how much of an influence Eddie was on them. Eddie's even said that uh, before all this COVID stuff started, he was working with Alex and Michael Anthony and trying to get David Lee Roth back together for one last, one last hurrah tour. And I know Sammy Hagar toured with him and Gary Sharon toured with him. I don't know if they'd be on the album too or if they'd tour to kind of make spots here and there. They had started kicking it around and then the whole coronavirus pandemic started and it got back burned. So all we could do is just wonder. We could dream. I know uh, Eddie was also saying his son Wolf was, uh, Wolfie as everybody called him, was working on a solo album. And you know Eddie had a lot to do in that. So that's going to be kind of interesting to see what happens, how that sounds. Um, poor Wolf Games always kind of lived in his dad's shadow and oh he's only, only in the band because of his dad and this and that. This would be a good chance to see what Wolfgang really has musically. Not saying he does or doesn't, but this would be one chance. You know, Eddie kind of, this is something I've created. Let's see how it sounds. Hopefully it sounds really good. I'm pretty sure it would be, be decent. I just hope Wolfgang isn't kind of like you know, John Bonham's kid, Jason. It's just kind of the, oh, you're John Bonham's kid. No, Jason's a great drummer. I just hope Wolfgang can get his own identity later, not just always be Eddie's kid. Because that is a big shadow you're under. Eddie, you will be missed, my brother, and um, respected and loved. Hello, this is Dan with the this week's album review. It's going to be Rolling Stone's album called Sticky Fingers. Sticky Fingers is the 11th American studio album by the English rock band The Rolling Stone. Released in April 1971. The original cover artwork received by Andy Warhol and photographed and designed by members of his art collective, The Factory, was highly innovative, showing a sexually suggestive picture of a man in tight jeans complete with a full, fully working zipper that opened to reveal a pair of underwear. Owing to the damage caused by the zipper to the vinyl disc itself and the expense in producing the unusual cover, later issues featured just the outer photograph of the jeans and so this is the album cover with the jeans and it's called sticky fingers and um, there's more t to go on this uh, this is a pretty interesting tale and, and part of the reason i picked this album for review sticky fingers is considered one of the rolling stones best albums it reached number one on both the uk albums and the u.s albums charts it has since achieved triple platinum status in the u.s songs such as brown sugar Dead Flowers, Wild Horses, Can't You Hear Me Knocking, and Moonlight Mile were chart toppers. Sticky Fingers was voted the second best album of the year in the Village Voice's annual Pop uh, Paz, Paz and Jop Critics Poll for 1971, based on American, American critic, uh, critics' votes. The album was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame and included in the Rolling Stone magazine 500 greatest albums of all time. Here's the track listing. Song 1, Brown Sugar. Song 2, Sway. Song 3, Wild Horses. Song 4 is Can't You Hear Me Knocking. Song 5, You Gotta Move. Song 6, Bitch. Next one is I Got the Blues, and then Sister Morphine. Uh, this was a cover song from Marianne Faithful. Uh, she recorded it and released it in 1969, and now it was released as a cover song by the Rolling Stones in 1971. The Sister Morphine song was cut during the Let It Bleed sessions earlier in March of the, uh, of the previous year for the album let it bleed and so they didn't use it and they held it over actually and then released it now here 
on the sticky finger. Song nine is Dead Flowers, and song 10 is Moonlight Mile. The two singles released were Brown Sugar and Wild Horses. But a lot of these songs uh, hit, hit the charts. The album's artwork emphasized the suggestion suggestive innuendo of the Sticky Fingers title showing a close-up of a jeans-clad male crotch with the visible outline of a penis. The cover of the original vinyl LP release featured a working zipper and perforations around the belt buckle that opened to reveal a sub-cover image of cotton briefs. The vinyl release displayed the band's name and album title along with the image of the belt. Behind the zipper, the white briefs were seemingly rubber stamped in gold with the stylized name of American pop artist Andy Warhol, Warhol which read, this photograph may not be, etc. While the artwork was conceived by Warhol, photography was actually by Billy Name and de the design by Craig Braun. Braun and his team had other ideas, such as wrapping the album in rolling paper, a concept later used by Cheech and Chong in their album, the Big Bamboo. But Jagger was enthused by Warhol's cover with the zipper. Execution was then handled as Warhol sent Braun Polaroid pictures of a model in tight jeans. The cover photo of a male model's crotch clad in tight blue jeans was assumed by many fans to be the image of Mick Jagger, but the people actually involved at the time of the photo shoot claimed that Warhol had several different men photographed and never revealed which shots were used. Among the candidates, Jed Johnson, yeah. who was Warhol's lover at the time, denied it being his likeness, although his brother, his twin brother Jay, is also a possibility. Those closest to the shoot and subsequent design, uh, named factory artist and designer Corey Tippin is the likeliest candidate. And Warhol superstar Joe D'Alessandro claims to actually have been the model. After retailers complained that the zipper was causing damage to the vinyl from stacked shipments of the record, the zipper was unzipped slightly down to the middle of the record where damage would be minimized. For the initial vinyl release, the album title and band name is smaller at the top on the American release. The UK release the title and band name are in a bigger letters and on the left. Now here's where it gets interesting. This album features the very first use of the logo of the of the, uh, the lips and tongue for the Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones record, originally designed by John Pash in 1970. Uh, this was the first use of the of this logo uh, of the tongue and the lips logo. Jagger suggested to Pash that he copy the outstuck tongue. The Hindu princess Kaylee, and while Pashi first felt it would be it would date the image and bring it back to the Indian culture craze of the 1960s, seeing Kaylee made him change his mind. Before the end of that year, his basic version was faxed to Craig Braun at Marshall Chess. The black and white copy was then modified with Braun and his team, resulting in the today's most popular red version, the slim one with the two white stripes on the tongue. Critic Sean Egan. Said, has said of the logo, without using the stone's name, it instantly conjures them, or at least Jagger, as well as a certain uh, lavaciousness uh, that the stones own. It quickly and deservedly became the most famous logo in the history of popular music. The tongue and lips design was part of a package that in, in 2003, VH1 named the number one greatest album cover of all time. In Spain, the original al album cover was covered, uh, was censored, I'm so sorry, the cover was censored by the Franco regime and replaced it with a can of fingers cover designed by John Pash and Phil Jude. And this is the can, uh, or an open can, like a food can, uh, open with, with human fingers inside called sticky fingers. So they use that in Spain. 
Sticky Fingers hit the number one spot on the British charts in 19 of, in May of 1971, remaining there for four straight weeks before returning to number one um, for one more further week in mid-June. In the U.S., the album hit number one within days of its release and stayed there for four straight weeks. According to Bill Ford's top 200 list, it was one of many American albums that topped the German chart that year. This is 1971. 1971. According to Acclaimed Music, it is the 48th most celebrated album in popular music history. Very famous. A lot of these songs uh, were very good. Uh, here is the personnel. Mick Jagger, lead vocal. Keith Richards, electro guitar. Mick Taylor, electro guitar. Bill Wyman, bass. And Charlie Watts is the drummer. That's what I've got for this week. Please leave your comments below and also see your suggestions for future reviews.